Warning, the radio broadcast you're about to hear was made by men and for men. It may at times seem a little rough around the edges, brash, and certainly not canonically approved by papal authority. But its content may indeed challenge you to become the man, father, husband God has called you to be. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to The Obligation, where we discuss topics in faith and in life to help you become the man God called you to be. Let's get started. Jason Murphy, another week of the obligation. Are you ready? Hey, John Eads. Yes, sir. I'm ready to rock and roll. Well, it seems like there are so many things going on. And I wanted to start today by just uh, telling, giving you an update. How about that? Uh, last night, Amy had some girlfriends over for dinner. And I took the kids out to eat at a Chinese restaurant because Amy doesn't like it. So I take advantage of it when, when I'm solo. Mm-hmm. And there was a family sitting nearby that had one little one. And uh, you know what? I decided to return the favor. I thought, you know what? I will buy their dinner like someone bought my dinner the week before. And uh, it was just an opportunity at the end where they came up and they said thank you. And I told them why I did it. And it was just, it was what makes the world go round in many ways. Jason. That's great. Now I'm glad you had the opportunity to do that. I also wanted to ask about another uh, special couple of days you had. I don't know if our listeners are aware. I think we've maybe mentioned it, uh, that your brother's a priest and you got the chance to see him and attend mass with him uh, yesterday. So how was that? Tell me about it, that. It was great. You know, um, when your brother's a priest, particularly a good priest, uh, it, it, provides a lot of opportunity for um, spiritual growth if you allow it. And I got to spend four days with them on and off over four days. And it included a few masses, some dinners and wine and uh, one-on-one time and time golf. with my wife. It was a little golf. We did golf, oh. which was awesome. We got to see some of his old friends from high school who are – still very much their faith is very much alive in them as well and their kids so it was just a it was a magnificent opportunity jason to as you get older to continue to have a relationship particularly with someone that has dedicated their life to the spiritual walk and uh it's interesting back because we have a backstory because i knew your brother before he was a priest probably when he was as a senior in high school or, or thereabouts, and we didn't know each other. And we didn't know each other for 20 years until we kind of our paths crossed for the men's conference, and now here we are. So it, it's funny how God starts you know, tying things together sometimes. That's exactly right. And um, I would go a step further. I learned some things from Michael this weekend. And one of the things I learned was about wisdom. And Again, we weren't planning to go here today, but it's something I've been thinking a lot about because as I watch him interact with others or contemplate how he's going to respond to questions that are asked or things that are said, he's very slow to give answers. At times, he'll even close his eyes, Jason, which makes it a little awkward for everybody involved. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, it's interesting because He's put in so much work and so much dedication on a daily basis to grow spiritually. And that includes reading and prayers. And I mean, when other peoples aren't thinking about Christ, he is. Hmm. And it's it's one of these things that as I've, I've, I've kind of reflected on his ability to be wise and to share good things. I think it comes from his commitment to his habits every single day in the spiritual walk. And as I was leaving, he actually handed me, um, uh, he was going to the airport. He he handed me this book that I'm holding up called Handbook of Prayers. Hmm. And it's from the Midwest Theological Forum. And again, I'm just getting through it each day, but this is his walk every single day, Jason. And uh, I was at a. I'm rambling here at this point. No, had, no. Uh, I was a, I, I was sitting down with a, an executive coaching client who came in town, and I was telling him how my brother was in town, and he's like, "Oh, isn't he a priest?" And he's not Catholic, so he says, "They're not allowed. Are they allowed to marry? Are they not allowed to marry?" And so I was educating him on 
on the priesthood and Catholicism in a in a nice professional manner, of course. And I said, I thought about it for a second, and I said, knowing what I go through on a daily basis from a marriage and a parenting and a professional setting, I'm happy our priests don't marry. Um, oh. Because it allows them the space to be a shepherd of souls and it allows them, I mean, it's not easy for them. And in times I think it can be probably very lonely, but it's tough being a parent and it's tough being married. And if I had to also shepherd the lives of all those in my parish or everyone that came to me at a need with sin, I think, I think it would be really difficult. And uh, yeah. and so it was one of those moments where you're describing Catholicism, which from the outside seems so like they can't marry. And mm-hmm. then and then on the inside, you're like, thank goodness they can't marry. Yeah, <laughs> I can't imagine, um, you know, just with the amount of. Of course, blessings, you know, don't want to lead in here with with the negative, but, you know, there is a lot of stress. Uh, there's a lot of emotion, um, you know. Some some situations with spouses can just envelop from a from the start from a bad day. Just someone waking up in a bad mood, and before you know it, you know you you've been short with your spouse, and you know possibly a an argument, and then the silence treatment, and you know you're you're down the road, and all that stuff. You know it's it's so internal to us. You know if we're really living the sacrament of marriage that. It it can it can affect us. It's just like if if you know any any sin that you know pulls us away and it, a choice away from God, it's going to affect us because it's pulling us from what we were created to be in living that vocation. So yeah, I I can't imagine trying to do that. Now there are many other rites within the Catholic Church that allow you know their priests uh, to be married, and um, you know apparently you know. They, they, they've worked out because they've been around for years and years and years. But the Roman right, you know, has has kind of had the the vision there to, to make sure that that's that, that remains separate. And, and they're, you know, the priests are married to their flock. They're married to the church. And that's where their focus is. And I think I think that's a that's a that's a very wise choice by the church. I agree that it could certainly be very lonely because, you know, a lot of people think that priests priests just, you know, just didn't want kids and didn't want to get married, but that's not the case. Many, many priests, most priests I would say, you know, wanted that life. I spoke to a priest earlier today uh, or earlier this week, uh, Father Peter Tremblay, who's a Franciscan priest and he's doing a retreat up in Hickory in August and so we had a small interview for the radio show and um that was something he thought God was calling him to, you know, thanks be to God. You know, he was able to answer his call to vocation. Now he's a, he's a great priest and he's preaching uh, retreats and, and bringing uh, faithful to Christ. And he works in a university setting at Elon college. Um, but, you know, they all, you know, that's a, that's something they sacrifice. It is a, it's a sacrifice. And, and as married men as well for the, you know, the other side of the coin and women, you know, we sacrifice that ability to focus solely on God through our vocation, through our, our, our spouses, through our children. So, so there's, there's, there's two sides of, you know, of of that coin there for sure. Um, But basically it boils down to sacrifice and love of God. And that's where we are. And I think, you know, even recently there's been another priest that discern out of there, there are men that discern out of the priesthood because they the call the desire to marry and have a family. And then there's priests, unfortunately, lately that have even left the church after years of the priesthood to marry. Um, and, and those are tough things. And, you know, it's one of these things that at the end of the day, you mentioned earlier about sin and, and thinking about sin. And it's like. Michael or the pre or a priest is not um, they sin as well and it's difficult and I was reading Tobit recently and to and, and it said there was a line in Tobit Jason it said those that sin are the enemy to their own lives those that mm-hmm. sin are the enemy to their own lives and we know how difficult it is and how there was only one perfect man so we naturally sin. But when we continue to choose to sin, we're our enemy to our own lives. And I think that's where having people like Michael in my life or that have discerned the priesthood where he can look at me and he said, when's the last time you've been to confession, John? Yeah. 
You know, how often are you going? This is an important thing for you to for you to continue on or you're going to continue to move towards sin, which in this case is the enemy to my own life. And um, and so it's it's special relationships like that, Jason. And I, I'll, I'll close with this about Michael and the priesthood, which is he was leaving, getting ready to get on the plane or go to the airport. And we were talking about our dad. And I said something to him like, it's made me really think about who I want to become. You know, the negative of the choices he's made and some of the good things he's made. Again, everybody goes through that. And I'll, I'll never forget this, Jason. He walked over and he gave me the biggest hug, man, with a smile on his face. Like this man that's dedicated his life to pursuing Christ and bringing Christ to others. Um, he was pleased at this self-realization that I've had in my own life. And I don't know, it's just one of those memories that I'll never forget. And we might not spend that many more days together, you know, the rest of our lives just because of distance yeah. and commitment. But, um, oh, what a great gift it was, Jason. That's great. I'm so glad. I, I, I was out of town, so I wasn't able to be there, but uh, certainly was there uh, in thoughts and prayers with you guys and with and with uh, with. Father Michael Eads, good friend. Father Michael Eads, uh, he, 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 when I was, um, when he was, had his eyes closed and he's thinking about how to be wise and all these things, I, I pulled out my phone at dinner and I wrote this down, Jason. I, I wrote down, wisdom doesn't need a way out. It finds a way out. And it's like, mm-hmm. there's something about the work that he's put in, in those 10 or 15 years now as a priest, it just finds its way out at the right time. And so... I just want to commend all those men and and really mothers that have that their sons have gone on to be priests because it's just it's such an important calling in in the world and um, even yesterday I was on a coaching call with a rabbi in Dallas Fort Worth Texas okay he goes I bet you've never coached a rabbi before and I said you're right I have not <laughs> um, but there's something so special about these men Jason that have, that have answered the call to, to the faith. And certainly the Catholic faith is, is the one true faith in my world and in your world. But those men that have, even the dads and the husbands that are making the call to bring the faith to their family and their kids, it just, it's wonderful. It makes me so happy. Yeah, no, it's great. I think everyone listening and as a you know, good reminder, I think everyone assumes since the priests are always surrounded by people when they see them on Sunday, you know, they assume that they've, you know, they're, they've got everyone around them, but there's been many a times after a, um, an Easter mass or, uh, you know, a Thanksgiving day mass that we've, uh, been walking out and just kind of mentioned off the cuff to the priest, Hey, if you don't have any plans and, and they've taken us up because they didn't have any plans. Cause I think everyone assumes they're, they're always busy and have people around them that they've, you know, they're always busy, but, uh, I would just just say, you know, think about that. And, you know, maybe if if you haven't, if you've never had a priest over to dinner, I think it's a great blessing that your family can see them outside of the context of just church and see them on a, on a real basis around a meal, get some wisdom, uh, you know, some blessings for your house and just have them over. And, and, you know, of course, you know, don't put them on put them on the spot to where they, you know, they got to perform, but but certainly allow them to relax and have a meal and just see that side. So I, I encourage everyone to, you know, tr- if you haven't ever done that, maybe reach out to your local parish priest, invite them to a, a dinner or a lunch and, and try to get to know them outside of the context of mass. Cause I don't think many people ever get that opportunity. Um, and it, it, it is a real blessing. It's been a blessing for us in the, in the few times we're able to do that um, to have them you know, around our house. And they need that. They need that family life because that's something they aspire to at one point, p- perhaps, and, and probably. Uh, uh, and to see that, I think it encourages priests. It encourages priests to see them, to see families that are, that are growing and living their faith. kind of like a, you know, just a, a, a note of accomplishment, you know, that they're, you know, that they're performing well and kind of, you know, seeing how their, their flock is doing. So it's a, it's a good opportunity. I would even go a step further. You know, it allows them a light into the world of what their parishioners are actually facing, the good yeah. and the bad, you know? Yes. I mean, it got it like just as an example for Michael to be able to sit down with 
my wife for 45 minutes and talk about real stuff going on and, you know, giving a confession uh, to her, or to John Ellis. He gave a mm-hmm. confession to John Ellis outside. It was like, it's a, it's a, it's a way for them to step in to what people are really struggling with or facing at home, which then allows them to preach better, better connect with yes. them better versus always being so like, um, philosophical or like kind of the pulpit. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, good. Stuff. Good. So you've got, you've got some other stuff going on right now. And, and we talked a little bit about prayer. We were going to discuss prayer today yeah. and what it means and why it's so important. So I'm going to be a little candid here. I had a, I had a pretty serious conversation with, with God the other day. I did. I, <laughs> It was uh, it was in the evening. I was by myself. I was in town. The rest of the family were were uh, still away at the beach, and uh, I just I got a you know I got a little emotional. I, I just felt like I wasn't doing things right, and um, and I asked God. I said, you know, what can I do? What what should I be doing? And it was it was uh, it was a you know uh, you know I wasn't up on the mountain. It wasn't a the, the clouds didn't, you know, form and, and you know, the voice from heaven cry out. But it was a, a moment of silent prayer. And I was I was a little worked up. And basically the the, the answer I got was keep doing what you're doing. Um, and that was hard for me to swallow uh, because I'm my I am my worst critic. I am all over myself. <laughs> if my kids or my wife think I'm on them, I am all over myself all the time. Um just judging and prodding. And I think God was just telling me to, you know, to, Hey, take a look at what you're doing. Look at the life you're giving your kids. Look at the faith that you're inspiring them with and showing them keep doing what you're doing. And, and I tried to argue back and I tried to argue back all the things and he went silent. Hmm. And, and I realized that, on a practical level, the noisier we are, the more we're going to drown out what God is trying to tell us. And so I just, I kind of, I paused and he just began to show me. I mean, I wasn't lifted up in some sort of ecstasy or anything. It was just a a moment of prayer. And he just, you know, kind of showed me the things in my life that I've been doing well and reminding me that you know, you're doing good. You're on the right path. Yes, we all need work. Yes, we sin. Um, And I think a lot, I was thinking, you know, where, because anxiety and, and, you know, worry, that all comes from somewhere. And I, and I've, I found that for me, it comes, I think it comes from fear. And so I'm trying, I was trying to pinpoint, you know, what is this fear that's because ultimately that, that will, that will take us right away. And there's an acronym that I've heard years ago, and I just kind of stumbled upon it again for fear. It's an acronym for fear, false evidence appearing real. And that is so true because my fear top down is that I'll be this, this father who ruins his kids. I guess without going into all this, I'll be this father that ruins his kids and they'll look back at me. They'll resent me and, and all the problems in their life will be because of the horrible father I was. Okay. That's just a, that's a big, ugly painted picture. I understand the fear of my kids. I fear they will become spoiled, entitled, unappreciative and faithless children. Hmm. Um, Of course we, you know, no one wants that of their children, but if we're guided by that and we're fearful of that, sometimes we can manifest our fears because we're so fixated on our fears instead of having that moment like I had in prayer that, you know, that day where I just stopped and listened. And that's what prayer is. And we've talked about that before. It's, it's just, it's being in the presence of God. And the more we Yes, there are prayers that we verbally say and that we, mentally, you know, spiritually say. There, the mass is a, is the greatest of prayers, um, and it's an outward sign. And there are, you know, verbal and 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 mental and spiritual. There's there's a lot of different varieties of prayer, but the essence of prayer is is truly just being in the presence of God. So I think 
that is where my anxiety comes because I will start to think I'm becoming this father. So I'm just going to drive on down that road and my kids are becoming those kids. And I'm going to have to be the domineering, you know, father to make sure that doesn't happen. But the more we do that, the more likely we shove them into that path. And that's the trick. So I, I guess that's, that's where I've been struggling with. I'm, tr you know, I try and pull back from that nosedive. But ultimately, I, I feel like I get, I get pulled in it and the devil knows what our faults are. And he knows what we're inclined to fall for. He knows the tricks to play. He knows the, the traps to set. And, and for me, you know, I guess it's good that we we talk about things like this and it's good that we bring them up like just like it's good to bring up things in confession another sign you know not just that it's the sacrament of confession but that we bring it up we acknowledge it so i'm acknowledging it here and <laughs> here and now you john i love it. where i am well i've got two things um that i one i appreciate the the honesty and the candor because that's where growth happens and um, when I was reading this book about prayer specifically, there was a line that jumped out at me. It says, but do not imagine that prayer is an action to be carried out and then forgotten. And what you're displaying here is that your continued draw towards God, most men wouldn't have asked in that moment for help. What do I do? They would just continue doing what they want to do or how they want to do it or make some drastic change without looking to the Lord. And while it doesn't make the situation any easier right away, it shows where you're rooted in, Jason. And again, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> But do not imagine that prayer is an action to be carried out and then forgotten. And yeah. I've had I had a similar moment this morning at 6 a.m. I missed a workout and I'm falling behind and I got all this stuff going on. And I just said, God, just help me see a path, man. Like I'm not asking for all the fruits of the labor, but just what are the right things and where's the right thing to give energy right now with all everything going on? And I didn't hear voices like you hear voices. I, maybe I'm not praying right. <laughs> um, but at oh, the same time, maybe I'm just crazy. <laughs> no, I don't think you're crazy. I think, <laughs> I think the beautiful part of it, Jason, is that that's what you're seeking and that's what I'm seeking. And to all the men and women out there that are listening that are seeking God first and going to prayer in good times and in bad on a daily basis, it shows where your heart is. It shows where your heart is in this difficult world and where the devil is attacking and where the society is telling you that you're doing everything wrong. Um, your heart is in the right place and you're pursuing Christ in prayer on a daily basis. And that is important. That is important. Um, there's a, well, let's end in some prayer here. I think it's an important time to uh, it's let's let, we're at a good place to pray, Jason. Let's end this in prayer. I'm the father, son, and Holy spirit. Amen. Uh, Lord, our God, uh, thank you for, encouraging us and drawing us closer to you. We know that your wisdom and your truth always prevails, especially when we seek you. Please continue to guide us on this path to you and your righteousness so that we become the men, the fathers, the husbands that you've created us to be and live that life and bring it to all others in our in our path. We ask these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hey guys, it's Jason Murphy again, just to remind you about the Ministry Minute. This is our weekly featurette highlighting ministry leaders throughout our diocese. Recently, I sat down with Franciscan Father Peter Tremblay, and here's a sneak peek of the upcoming Ministry Minute. Sitting down today with Franciscan Father Peter Tremblay. Father Tremblay is a priest in the Diocese of Raleigh who is currently the Director of Campus Ministry and Associate Chaplain for Catholic Life at Elon University. Father, thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to be with you. Yeah, it's great. I, I see you're you're one of the many New York transplants we have in the Carolinas. Well, the, uh, I, I the Yeah, yeah, it's not New York, it's Buffalo. 
Okay, so there you go. I'm very right. proud of my uh, my my uh, heritage being a Buffalonian and and uh, football and and food and I, I love uh, I love all things Buffalo. Miss it a lot. Definitely a distinction. I think yes. uh, those from New York will clarify they're from New York, and those from Buffalo are going to clarify they're from Buffalo. So that's <laughs> that's great. It's a fun rivalry. Um, so we we're talking earlier mentioning that, you know, a lot of folks who, you know, a lot of Catholics really don't ever get a chance to, you know, hear hear the backstory or get to know their priest on, on really a personal level. So I thought maybe we'd start off with perhaps, you know, how old were you when you first, first started thinking about a vocation? And ultimately, you know, when did you decide to start discerning and then ultimately, you know, becoming a priest? We'd love to hear about that. Yeah, I, I appreciate the question. Um, so I think the context for me was tremendous health difficulties and struggles when I was a teenager. And it was a very faithful family that I was blessed with. Mom and dad were incredibly devout. Uh, my brothers were very devout. And it was prayer and my faith that was able to get me through some very serious life and death struggles as a teenager. And at about the age of 16, there was this sense that the joy and the hope that my faith had given me and, and supported me with was something that maybe I would want to live in a very intentional way and share that with people. I was hoping that that nagging feeling would go away because I wanted to be married and I wanted to have a family uh, just like my parents, but it didn't go away. So finally, after college, I joined the Franciscans, the same friars who ran the high school that I went to outside of Buffalo, New York, the conventual Franciscan friars. I spent two years working with the poor on the streets of Philadelphia uh, as a uh, postulant, and I've been with the Franciscans ever since. That's great. That's excellent. I heard you're a little bit of a woodworker. Uh, yeah, yeah, I am. It's uh, something I got into years ago. I, um, I love the ministry of the mind and the heart and the soul, but Boy, I tell you, every now and again, I have to get my hands dirty doing something or building or making something. So it was a hobby that's just developed organically, and I build uh, all kinds of different uh, things out of wood. And uh, I love giving it all away. It's just uh, that's p part of the fun. I think men need that. We need to to have something to be able to work with our hands. It's just innately in, in all of us. Uh, all of St. Joseph. I think that's that's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and I noticed you built an altar, I guess, uh, as the uh, chaplain for Elon University. You have a, a new altar. To, that's right. That yeah. So that was the height of the pandemic when everybody was sitting around doing nothing. I, I went to the workshop and built a new altar for our ministry because we really needed one, the one that we had been using. And it's it's a temporary altar that needs to be moved every time we celebrate mass. So the bishop came out and blessed it. Uh, we had a beautiful mass. We had a hundred students show up so, in a huge gymnasium to see the bishop and have the new altar blessed. Um, you know, social distancing, and we were safe. But what a joyful experience! Yeah, it's it's nice That's to beautiful. give back. To them. Absolutely. I hear you have a retreat coming up at the Catholic Conference Center in Hickory. From soldier to saint, my first instinct when I heard that was it has to be Saint Ignatius, but uh, this is a little bit different. <laughs> Oh dear. Oh, I, I, I need to retitle this then. No, no, no. Uh, I was thinking both as a summation of, of kind of the militancy of Saul of Tarsus arresting and killing Christians, but also the initial hopes and dreams of St. Francis of Assisi of wanting to go off to the Crusades and be a great, uh, a great crusader, a great warrior. But it does fit Ignatius. That's, that's, I hadn't thought of that. Oh my goodness. Well, um, I've done a few Ignatian retreats up there. So I guess it was already uh, in the back yeah, of my that's head. Right. So I'm, so. I'm so Franciscan at heart. It hadn't even crossed <laughs> my mind, but I'm excited. I haven't preached a men's retreat probably in five years. So this is an exciting opportunity for me to really develop a spirituality that feels very authentic and very, very timely. I think we live in a world where the faith of the church is misunderstood. A lot of people are really wrestling with what does it mean, you know, just gender questions. And then, of course, the question of, of masculinity. And I think uh, Paul and Francis are some of the finest examples of Christian masculinity that we have. So that's coming up August 6th to the 8th, correct? Can you tell correct. us a little bit about what will take place uh, during that weekend? 
got a, a schedule that I, I'm really excited about. Uh, begin Friday evening with a, a little reception, some dinner. Our first talk is after dinner Friday night. And then Saturday from 8 a.m. at breakfast straight through till about 8 o'clock at night, we've got things. We're going to have uh, three more talks on Saturday. Uh, plenty of time for confession, spiritual direction, um, and some free time for personal prayer. Lots of adoration will be available. Sunday morning, um, mass, and then uh, brunch, and that'll be that'll be the retreat. So it's it's full, but I really like the balance of time for personal prayer as well as time to be together. Absolutely. Well, Father, that's about all we have for the Ministry Minute. We appreciate you uh, taking the time to come on board and also answering the call, and, uh, following your vocation to uh, continue uh, our Lord's ministry. So uh, God bless, and we hope prayers will be with you for the retreat. And we'd love to have you come on the Obligation Radio Show one day because this was much too short. I'd love to join you again. Thank you for the opportunity and uh, looking forward to the retreat. All right. God bless. God bless. God bless.